Good morning, sir. Can you hear and see us? I can indeed. Thank you. Um, our first witness this morning is Mr. Thomas English. Yeah. <coughs> okay, if you'd like to stand yes. up, please, take that in your right hand and just repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall, give shall, be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth and, and nothing but the truth. Good morning, Mr. English. Good morning, Thank sir. Thank you very much for coming. Um, as you know, Mr. English, my name is Catriona Hodge, and I ask questions on behalf of yes. the inquiry. Please, can you state your full name? Thomas Edward English. Thank you. Um, you made a statement, Mr. English, on the 9th of February of this year. Is that correct? Yes. Um, do you have a copy of that statement before you? Yes. Could I please ask you to turn uh, to the final page of your statement? Should be page 16. There, on the back, yes. Do you see your signature in the middle of that? Yes, page? that's my signature. Um, have you had an opportunity to read that statement yes. since it was first made? Yes. And it, is its content true to the best of your knowledge? Yes. And belief? I'd like to begin by asking um, you a few questions about your background, if I may. Yes. Um, how old are you now, Mr. Uh, 69 now, 70 this year. Um, are you married? Yes. For how long have you been married? Uh, since 1979, September 79. And um, do you have any children? I've got two daughters. How old are they? 37 at the weekend and 35. Can you please tell me about your career before you went to work for the post office? Yes. Um, I was uh, schooled in Middlesbrough. And then I left Middlesbrough in 1969 and joined the Royal Marines as a 16 and a half year old boy. Uh, stayed there until um, 1st of April 77. And then on the 4th of April 77, I joined the Metropolitan Police um, and served at Stoke Newington Police Station here in London. I then transferred up to Leicester because a girl I'd met Still, my wife uh, um, didn't want to live in London, and so we went to Leicester, where she came from. Uh, and I spent 20, 20 or so years in Leicester, um, and then I left the police force through a medical problem. Um, and then we decided on settling for a post office to make a living, because my daughters at that time were only 12 and 13, and uh, we needed more money than my police pension was paying me to survive. So um, I'd got problems getting a job um, because of a blood disorder I've got, um, which is genetic. And uh, I settled for the post office um, as, as a way of survival. What had attracted you firstly to your role in the Royal Marines and the police force? Um, well, I suppose um, I was a natural competitor. I've always been sport mad, sport minded as a kid. I was out playing football, played rugby for 15 years. And um, it just seemed a natural progression that I leave Middlesbrough. I didn't want to go in the steelworks. And, and I thought, well, I'm going to go and I'm going to leave. And I made the biggest train journey of of my life, from Middlesbrough all the way down to Deal in Kent, um, on my own. And, uh, I mean, I had to get my mum to sign me into the military because I was underage, technically. Um, and off I went and spent eight years there. Did you enjoy it? Oh, yes. I just got into sport again, didn't I? And, and I enjoyed soldiering. Um, it was me, really. What attracted you to working for the post office? Well, I tried, after I left the police force, I tried to get jobs with them. And I don't know what happened at the time, but it seemed that they'd put a, a little line at the bottom. If you don't hear from us within a month, then you're not successful. And I thought, I've just given you 20 years of my life and you can't even write to me and say, sorry, Tom, you've been unsuccessful. Um, 
So as time went on, I thought, well, I've got to make a move because the girls are getting bigger and, and they're getting older and, and I need some stability. I can't go around, you know, hunting for jobs because of my illness, which, which nearly killed me. Um, I thought, I've got to survive. So the next best thing is I'll go down this avenue of being self-employed and work at that. What did the process of applying to be a sub-postmaster involve? I wrote to the post office. I went for an initial interview at Bishop Street in Leicester, which was their crown office. Um, I then sat some exams there and um, I was successful. I then had to go away and write, and I've still got it to this day, um, um, a study of the business. Of, of what I would do if I was given an office and how I would make it better. And um, so I, I wrote this business document and submitted it to them and they said, yeah, that's fine. And then I went for an interview at Derby with Nigel Crompton, excuse me, who turned out to be my line manager. There was another lady with him, I can't remember her name, but she was a sub postmistress. And they interviewed my wife and I for four hours in Derby, and then at the end of it, he said, you've got the job. Um, I was about to ask you which post office you ran, but it's the Great yeah, Haywood. Great Haywood Post Office, yep. Yeah. Um, how did you acquire that branch? Uh, I purchased it. I, I, I looked at, I went all around the country. I mean, Norfolk, Devon, the northeast, um, and we settled for that because I just thought position, position, position. It's a Grade Two listed building, which was part of the Lord Lichfield's estate, Patrick Anson. It was part of his estate many years ago, and and it's such a nice building, built about 1790ish. Nobody seems to know exactly, and um, and I thought. I'll never lose money on this place. Um, and we decided to take the office. And I didn't want too big a business because I didn't want to neglect my daughters. Because, as I say, they were 12 and 13. We'd uprooted them from Leicester, from all their friends, and we went there. And we did get a bit of flack like that initially from them. You know, you've taken us away from our friends, which is to be expected. And, but they soon settled down. Um, at the local school, and uh, um, it, it turned, you know, it was a good move that way. How much money did you invest in the business? It, about £66,000, bearing in mind removal costs from Leicester over to, to um, Stafford. Then I had to buy the business as well, and normally you, you paid two to two and a half times the salary for the business. So the salary when I took it on was about £22,000 a year, and that was the 3rd of February, 1999. And um, as I say, uh, so, so that would have been somewhere in the regions of £44,000 I'd paid for the business. And then there was some modernisation to go on and, and removal and purchase fees, those, those kind of things, which added up. Did the purchase price cover the premises itself, the cost of the premises itself? No, no. what I did was I took out um, a, a £50,000 mortgage on the premises as well, because um, I think the premises cost in total about £140,000 then, which was a considerable sum. Well, it's a considerable sum now. But having said that, um, we did some repairs and renovations, and uh, and that's where the money the money went. When did your appointment as a sub postmaster begin? Oh, I I moved into the premises on the third of February ninety nine, and uh, the next morning we were open for business. What support did your wife provide in running the business? Everything. Everything. I mean, she was a bit disheartened at first because with the children and with everything in boxes all around us and we were expected to trade 
And she's thinking, well, what about the kids' dinner? And, and what about getting all these boxes and, and making a home? And, and, I mean, it took quite a long time. And, and I think it got her down a little bit. And, uh, I, I mean, once or twice she just said, said you know, oh, I wish we'd never come back. We should have stayed in Leicester, you know. I said, no, it'll, it'll, it'll pan out. You know, just keep going. Um, not long after your appointment, um, there was an attempted robbery. Yeah, well, that was that in the... I, I took up, as I say, I became an official sub-postmaster on the 4th of February, 1999. And then it was a Saturday morning on the... Um, in August. And, and it was 20 past nine on a Saturday morning. And it was a bit quiet. And I thought, well, I'll just flip through the paper, you know, at the desk and have a read. And then the door opened and in come these two lads, all dressed in black. And he, they rolled the balaclavas down, and all he could see was their eyes. And I thought, well, I won't tell you what I thought, but I thought, here we go. And one of them stood in front of me and said, give me your money and I won't hurt you. And the other one had a rifle, and he, he had a cover over it. it and, and I could see the metal barrel of the gun. And I thought, mm, OK. And I just went up in the air, basically. It was just action and reaction. I just exploded. Um, pressed the alarms, which panicked them, because they are very, very loud. And um, I then ran through the house to, to get through, because the entrance to my house was the entrance for the, all the public. I mean, I got a 1,000 people a week through my front door. And I ran through the kitchen, through the back room, through the living room, opened the door into the post office from my living room, and then ran out into the street, and they had a stolen car outside with a getaway driver. So I, they jumped in and just got away, and then I got the number, we rang the police, and um, the police were in the area, and eventually they went over to Abbots Bromley, and they were caught trying to do something over there. But prior to that, they went to uh, Phillybrook Service Station up near Trentham Gardens. And I mean, there, there were a pair of thugs, really, because they hit the, the young girl who was at Phillybrook Service Station, which is a garage. It isn't now, but it was. And they hit her and f for 20 cigarettes. And I thought, well, they, they were particularly nasty fellas, these. And, um, and one of them, apparently, in the paper, had previous for hitting his mum. I thought, well, you're not a very good advert for a manhood if you're going around belting your mum. So um, they got their desserts and they went to prison. Uh, the post office, we rang them up and said, we've had a robbery. And all they said was, uh, well, how much did they get? And I said, nothing. Oh, OK. And uh, just close the office and... And, well, my wife was fell apart a bit after that, through the shock. It was just latent shock, I suppose. And um, they didn't even send her a bunch of flowers. They didn't even do anything. And I thought, oh, hang on a minute. That's not very good. And I'd only been in, in position eight months. Well, if they're going to treat me like that, what are they going to do to the others who've sat here in this chair? Their attitude is not very good. When was the Horizon system first installed in your branch? Uh, about 2004. I was a latecomer to that, to that because um, of my appointment was in 99 and they'd already had a rollout. Um, but we were all paper-based. Everything was worked out on, on a proper chart, which we submitted to the post office. And obviously everything had to balance and you could cross it along and check it up down, left hand, right hand side, the lot. And uh, everything was paper-based. What training did you receive from the post office when Horizon was installed? When, gosh, the post office isn't, like a lot of people think, it's glamorous. It's, you know, you open at nine and you close at five. It isn't like that at all. It was seven days a week, non-stop. Because you've got your ancillary business, and we chose this business because it wasn't too big, and we could still spend time with our daughters. And um, our ancillary business probably only gave us about seven or eight thousand pounds a year, 
uh, which we kept fine, you know, we fine tuned it to that because we used to go out every Thursday and every Saturday and Sunday around warehouses ourselves looking for things we could work out to sell in the shop. And then you'd take them home, unbox them, work out a price for them, put the price on the item, store it or put it in the shop. Um, so basically the whole job was 24 seven really because you were open Saturdays for the post office anyhow, and you closed about one o'clock. Um, by the time you'd cashed up and declared all your cash and, and things. Um, so it was busy. Um, and how did you fit training in? Around well, what we did was they sent us these CD discs or DVDs. So we had a DVD and we put it in. And you had to self-teach. And we sat for hours in the evening after we'd, we'd had our dinner. And, and we'd sit till like 10, 11 o'clock at night looking at these videos, trying to learn a computer from a video. And we did that for many, many hours. Um, and then um, we went for some training. And I can't remember where I went in Stafford for it. But we did it separate because Brenda had to run the office and I had to go to training. And it was a, it was a week's training. And um, we had this Canadian fellow. I'm sure he's Canadian. Um, and he said, uh, look, about this system, um, the, the post office have told me not to tell you this, but there are problems with this system. They have experienced problems. And one of the lads, because I wasn't really computer literate, um, and one of the lads, about my age, he said, yeah, but this is a second-hand system. This is not a good system. And I thought, oh. And then with what the instructor said, this is not a good... And they've had problems with it. So that's within five years of rollout. I thought, oh be careful because this thing can bite you and that was always in my mind were you given an opportunity to use the horizon system during your group training i i'm going to say no um but i don't remember sitting there with a computer in front of me i, I just can't remember that and that's the best answer i can give what training did you receive from the post office after it had been installed in your property? We had a very nice lady come to stay with us, um, not live with us, obviously, but train us for about four days or so. Four days or so. And um, then she left us on our own and we thought, oh, this is it now. <laughs> and, and you just get on with it. And you just try and remember what you've been taught and what you've been told and... Uh, as I say, and just hope it pans out okay for you from there. How's I would say about a year before I really knew what I was doing. Forgive me, I was going to ask, how suitable do you think the training was in preparing you to run the branch? I don't think it was adequate. No, I don't. Did you experience problems when using the Horizon system? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um... You had uh, problems with communication, i.e. from the internet. From, and, and I think part of the problem was I went and spoke to the post office engineer who was at the, at the green box outside one day. I says, what's going down? Uh, he goes, well, the problem is we're using um, copper wires, he says, and, and they, they snap and they break and they break the connections. And I thought, well, I wonder if this is causing some of the problems that people are alleging they're having. Um, and, and eventually they change things to, to the fibre optic. Uh, but you still had problems. I mean, these problems that people have reported, and we knew it because we used to go to sub-postmasters meetings. And um, we'd sit there, and, and don't, the average age of a sub-postmaster was quite old, you know. Um, the average age of somebody going into the post office was quite old. It was certainly mid-40s. 
and you'd, you and, and after these meetings with the post office because we'd browbeat them we'd sit there and we'd have a pint and a you know something to eat and a cob and and we'd talk about well what do you know what do you know and we'd all question each other and say well i know this i know that and and a story would emerge and because we weren't sort of all together all the time we were spread out um, you, you learnt that things were not hunky-dory. You've just described attending group oh, meetings with yeah, the Yeah, with the post office. Where would those be held? <sighs> well, the Garth Hotel doesn't exist anymore. That's now houses. Um, but we had... and We went up to um, a hotel in... Um, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, 10 miles, 12 miles away from us. Um, um, and there was other premises where we went to and had meetings. How frequently would these meetings be held? Well, you had one about every six months or so, and then they started to drop off, and I don't know why. But it was a way you could quiz them and, and air your problems. Uh, Stone is the place we used to go to, the hotel in Stone at St and um, but there were other premises, and we we could air our problems, and hopefully they'd be listened to, and then they'd tell us where the post office was going and and what was happening, and uh, and what was in the pipeline. Who was in attendance at these meetings on behalf of the post office? <sighs> people up the food chain. That's all I can say. Um, people in the know. Uh, not terribly, terribly high, but, you know, man managers, area managers, these kind of people. Did you ever... And Mr English, sorry to interrupt, um, because I, I, this is quite interesting to me. Were the sub-postmasters who attended these meetings essentially from your area around Staffordshire, or did they come from all over...? They, they they didn't come from all over, sir. No, they they were were Staffordshire lads, and I right. I mean, you know, within sort of ten or fifteen mile radius. Right. So so I've got the picture. It was a kind of area. Yes, sir. Um, meeting. Yes. At which area managers, stroke managers of the post office would be there, sub postmasters would be there. Yes. And in those um, discussions. Am I right in uh, taking from your evidence that problems with Horizon were discussed? Yes. Fine, thanks. Do you, do you recall any specific issues being raised? Um, just uh, balances um, and uh, the fact that some transactions w were going wrong and nobody could account for why they had problems. Um, I would bring up issues and just say, uh, when, when in fact, when they, they accused me of, of, of theft, I just said to everybody at the meeting, look, fellas, please be aware, I've been accused of theft and fraud from the post office, and what's happened is this, and I explained it to them. I says, I'm not ashamed. I says, I'm ashamed they've accused me. I says, but please be aware that you know, you could be next. On a day-to-day -day basis, to whom would you look for support when you experienced a problem balancing... On a day-to-day -day basis, it's the helpline. Um, and you could get good people at the helpline. I suppose it depended on their experience and how long they'd been doing the job for. If you get a newcomer, you know, it, it's, it's, they're not going to have the experience of somebody who's been there a while. And, and they could only do so much. Um, and if it's a problem that they couldn't solve, you, they would pass it on up the line to Chesterfield, to the accounts department, and, and they would register it there. And then, invariably, they'd be in touch with you. Or, excuse me, they might be in touch with you. Uh, sorry, you might be in touch with them. So that, that's how it worked. Um, how often would you say you contacted the helpline? Oh, quite regularly, yes. Um, 
I, I, I suppose it's this thing going back to training. This can bite you on the bum time. Um, and you're thinking, I've got to be cautious here because um, I, I'm one of those people that if I've got a problem, I'll come and tell you about it. And that is my safeguard. Because you know, you can't say to me, oh, well, you've hid this away, you haven't said anything to anybody else. I'll say, this has happened, that's happened, what are we going to do about it? In your statement, you referred to an incident in December 2005. Yep. Can you please describe what occurred on that occasion? Right, where are we on the statement? <laughs> Forgive me. This is... Um... On page five, paragraph 26, it relates to um, yeah. the problem with the personal banking programme. Would you be able to explain what happened? Yeah, yeah. what happened there was, again, it's this, it's this um, copper in the, in the telephone lines problem, I think. The, 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 the horizon would crash um, and you couldn't carry out transactions. So you'd ring them and say, oh, my system's gone, down they go. Oh, we know. Well, yes. Well, keep the office open and do what you can. But the system's gone down. Oh, but you can still carry out certain transactions. Yes, but what happens if they want to pay by cheque and credit card and cash? Because you could pay transactions using all those methods and you could interchange among those three to pay one bill. And, and you say, well, if somebody wants to come in and pay a bill and say, Tom, I want 500 quid... can't give them 500 quid so they can't pay the bill. Oh, well, I says, look, best thing is to do, close the office, we don't get any mistakes then. We know where the crash has happened, we know when it's happened, and hopefully everything's backed up and you've saved everything. And that's what we would say to them. Um, and... Well, well, I've said there, yeah, accept payments in part, cash and card and cheque. Um... I mean, people would pay their bills out of their pensions. Well, if I can't give you your pension, you can't pay your bill. So what's the, what's the point of keeping the office open? Because you can't transact, so you close the office. And that's what used to happen. I mean, once it went down for four days. And I thought, I've got four days. I thought, what am I going to do? So my brother-in-law and I went out and we bought a load of wood and we ripped the bedroom floor up and installed a new floor. <laughs> in the bedroom, which pleased my wife, but... <laughs> yeah, and, and we used the four days that way. And then we got back online and opened the office again. I mean, it's so sad because when you live in a village, everybody knows you. Everybody knew me in my village. Everybody knows me now. And I've been there 23 years, and we closed eight years ago, and I'm Tom from the post office. And... Um, it's quite embarrassing. When are you going to open? You know, what's, what's happening? What's going on here? I don't know. It's down to the post office. I'm very sorry. And you've got a note on your door. Sorry, not open. Um, did you report the issues that you'd experienced to the helpline? Oh, oh, you ring them. You just ring them and say, look, the line's gone down. Well, they know your computer's gone down. They know it's crashed. Sometimes it would be a local thing. Sometimes it would be an area thing. Were there occasions when you had errors and problems which the helpline helped you to resolve? Yes. Sometimes you could resolve something that had gone wrong and sometimes you couldn't and it was referred up the food chain to Chesterfield and sometimes Chesterfield weren't very nice to you. Um, with one document, a docket it was, a pension docket... And I forget how much it was for, it was about £127. It's in the statement somewhere, but off the top of my head. We, when you take a pension docket, the, lady, the person comes in, gives you your book, there you are, Tom, and you open the book up to the date and you stamp it twice. Once on the stub, once on the docket. So you rip the docket off and then you would scan the book and then insert the amount that's on the docket into the horizon system. 
and then it would come up and you'd pay them accordingly. Then you would take that docket, which is not a lot bigger than that, and you'd have a box with sections in it. And the dockets were different kinds of pensions, like one, two, three, four to 12 or whatever it was. And you'd put them in value order, so smallest value first, highest value to the end in each of them sections. And then what you'd do at the end of the day, you would get all them dockets out and you would make sure they're in the right order with the right sequencing, one, two, three, four, five. And then you would add them all up. So I would go, my wife had a, um, a calculator with a printer on it. We went out and purchased it ourselves because you had to do that. Our um, stamps, because they had the old fashioned stamps with the ink, but we went and bought these Ludwig things, which cost, I mean, two of them cost me 250 quid. And even though I'd paid for them, they weren't my, they weren't my property, they were the property of the post office, but because I purchased them, I was responsible to Ludwig's for their repair and replacement should anything go wrong. And basically, I can understand to a degree why, because that stamp is official, it's a governmental thing. You know, the government owned the post office and it's their baby. And we did it because it was cheaper than inking up pads and doing that all the time, the old fashioned way. So we, we had them and um, we tot all, tot all the dockets up at the end of the day. And then Brenda would, I'd just sing out how much they were and she'd go, item one, there's a, item two. And then you'd have a full total at the end. Well, we did about 35,000 quid worth of pensions every week. To, to the old folk in the village. And um, that was that. Um, and at the end of the week, we'd put all these together, so the dockets and the till roll that we'd printed off, and the horizon roll, because it's on the horizon as well, as long as them two figures matched up and all the dockets were on there, that's done. And we'd parcel them up in a bag and then we'd, uh, they'd go off to Lisa Halley in Northern Ireland. And then, one day, a few months later, I got this message that uh, I, I was um, 127 or 147 pounds down. I thought, no, I'm not. Oh, you, you didn't put a docket in the system. I says, yes, I did. And they said, no, you didn't. I said, well, prove I didn't. I says, well, I can't. I says, well, so, we, we, you know, there's an impasse. I said, I've done it. You said, I haven't. I says, why at Lisa Halley, have they lost it at Lisa Halley? Because I said, when my wife and I did it, it was there. I said, not only is it there, it's on the till rolls and it's in the horizon. So I said, I'll tell you what, this is a mechanical transaction. It's electronic transaction. It's barcoded. I've scanned the barcode. Tell me who that barcode relates to. Oh, no, that's too long and complicated, they said. I said, well, that's not my problem. You're accusing me of losing £147 or thereabouts. So I said, it's an tr electronic transaction. You can trace it. No, we don't want to do that. You just pay us the money. Oh, check it out your wages. I says, well, that's not very nice, is it? I says, because I've registered this docket. You tell me who it's to, I know I will know who it belongs to, and I will go to their house. No. So I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll ring up the DWP. So I rang up the Department of Work and Pensions, and I said, uh, lady says, oh, yes, it's entirely trans... Yeah, you can trace exactly who, this own who owns this. She said, and they should be able to do it. I said, but they won't. She says, well, I can't do it because I don't know. She says, but they've got the information. So basically, I ended up having to pay that money much against my will. And, and I said, they couldn't prove I'd not done it. And I couldn't prove they'd lost it at Lisa Halley. So I said, no, I'm not happy with this. You've got your money. It's in the system. How can you say I've taken it or lost it or all you're talking about is a little missing piece of paper about that big 
but the transaction is on the accounts. So we paid that money, um, and then you just think, hmm, things are going downhill. You experience further discrepancies. Oh, yeah. In your um, so you've described yep. um, two separate shortfalls of £250. Yeah, well... <laughs> We, we balanced, and we used to balance every month then. And we did the balance, and we'd go, we're 250 quid down. How can we be 250 quid down? So you'd get all your cash out, and all your stamps, and all your stock again. And what I used to do is, I'd get an A4 piece of paper, and then I'd put on it the week, the account week, the date from and to, it, the week it covers, and I'd put all my cash, one pence, two pence, five pence, every bit of cash I had down to the notes, and then in the middle I'd put all the stamps, one, two, all the stamps in the middle, all your milk tokens, all your foreign currency, um, and everything, all your um, other stamps like uh, presentation packs and things like this, and, and your presentation envelopes, and. And you count them all up again. You think, right. So if that all tallies, and then you can look at the previous weeks, because you can balance that against stock in and stock out and what you've sold, you're thinking, hang on a minute. That 250 quid, I must have given it to somebody over the counter. That's the only thing you can say in the end. And go, but you don't give 250 quid over the counter. So we thought, oh, so good. Letter in the, in the envelope, where you send all your accounts away, and there's a big brown envelope. Letter in there. We've got a £250 discrepancy. You'd back that up by making a telephone call to the helpline and go, we're 250 quid down, but we don't understand why. Is there anything you can help us with? No. Nope. So we're looking at each other. And then, a month later, 250 quid again. And I'm thinking, hang on a minute, it's 250 quid. Twice in two months, the same amount. What's going wrong? I know my wife wouldn't do it. I know I wouldn't give out the 250 quid. I mean, that's a lot of money to give away. And, um, and even if you give it out in fivers, imagine how many people you'd have to pay, 40, 50 people in fivers to, to make that money. I'm thinking, no. So you tell the helpline again, say, look, I'm another 250 quid down. Why is that? No, so you've got to put the money in. So that was that one. Um, I'd like to ask you about, um, I think, was the largest shortfall you experienced of £3,873? Well, it wasn't really, was it? It was like £4,000 plus. Because what happened is, initially, and I'm not referring to my statement, off the top of my head again, I was... And, and the lady came in, and it was that one where I... Stamped her, um, seven Trent water bill it was. And I thought, right, stamp the water bill, scan it through, get the receipt from the horizon, staple it to it and give, her this, give it back. So, just, there you are, thank you very much. And then, when I did my gyros on the night, I thought, oh no, Tom, you've made a mistake. You didn't take the stub from the bottom of the form she brought in. Because you've got the rip-off stubs, haven't you, at the bottom, I thought. I made a cock up, so I thought, right, I'll just go and see the lady because I know where she lives. So what I did is, when I sent me gyros off daily, you got um, like uh, an A5, half an A4, and it was a black, I'm sure it was a black, because you had a black one and a red one, and I'm sure it was a black one that I did daily, and then you'd put them in a, in a, in a blue envelope for gyro bank, and then... Um, I, I looked at it and I thought, right, I had the money in the system, I had the horizon receipt, it showed on the horizon screen, and I left the money in the system. So what I did, I got this piece of paper, and I thought, right, I'm going to test them now. And it says, do not staple or put anything, so I thought, T to this thing. So I thought, well, I'm going to do it. So I thought, I wrote a little letter, 
saying, I'm very sorry, I've made a mistake. I did not take the lady's stub off the Seven Trent water bill. It's for this. The money is in the account, it's in the system, and you can see it's there. And, and I just clipped it to it with a stapler in the top left-hand corner, put it in the envelope and sent it off. I thought, somebody's got to look at that and they've got to detach it from that slip so I know I've got their attention. And I thought, well, they're not going to rip it off because they're not going to rip an official piece of paper like that. So they've obviously took it off one of them staple removers. And because um, when I asked for the evidence, they sent it back to me and there it came with the, and they'd enlarged it. And there was the two holes in the top left hand corner. I thought, well, they've had the message because they've taken it off. They've detached it. And uh, so they sent me an error notice. I thought, OK, fair cop. I didn't take the stub, so they're giving me an error. But the money is in the account. And then um, I saw the lady, I got the stub, and then I put it in the following week or the following month's account. Now, this was the October time. Um, and I thought, right, I'll do it again. So I stapled another note saying, I have recovered the said amount to... You, I'm not including it in this account because you've already had the money. Please rectify. So they sent me another error notice. I thought, so I rang them up. I said, look. I says, one balances the other out. I'm being honest. I've told you I didn't take the stub. What are you doing? And they said, oh, no, you've got to... I says, well, I can't. I couldn't do it that way because I made a mistake. I didn't take any monies. The money's there. So, anyway... It got sorted by Christmas, so it took about three months. So I thought, OK. Christmas came and went, New Year came and went. And then I logged on one February morning. About half past eight on a Saturday morning it was, because I would prepare the office then, ready for nine o'clock. And I looked at it and I thought, what the hell is this on the computer? And it was like a message with... No punctuation marks, no full stops, no nothing, no capital letters. And it was just like ticker tape. I thought, what? Somebody having a joke? So then, like an email, you start to decipher it. You're going, what's all this? And I'm going, you've been accused of fraud and theft from the computer. I thought, don't talk so stupid. And that had taken... A hundred and... Which was the sum of this seven Trent water bill that belonged to the lady. I thought, well, they know I haven't taken it. They've had it. It's said in the account. We spent three months hammering this problem out. And, and it was somebody called Nicky Moore, I think her name was. And I thought, hmm. And I went ballistic. Because, I mean, when you consider that... I run the village post office. Everybody knows me and everybody knows my wife. And when things like this come out, people go, oh, he's been thieving money. And people have said that in this chair before me. I'm quite well aware of that. And you think, well, hang on a minute. I'm an ex-policeman. People know me. People all around the United Kingdom know me because I was in the Marines with them, because I served in the Metropolitan Police with them, because I served in Leicester with them. And the villagers know me because I run their post office. And they're going, oh, well, he's bent, he is. Wonder what he did in the police force. Was he bent then? And you're thinking, this is a real stain on my character, this is. So anyway, I says, look, I haven't taken any monies. I want to speak to Nicky Moore. Well, you can't. I said, I'm telling you now, if she's going to accuse me, I want to speak to Nicky Moore. I said, get her on the line. And they said, well, you can't speak to her. I said, well, don't accuse me of theft. I says, if you want to do it, come and see me or get Nicky Moore to ring me. I says, and I want to know the day, the date, the time, the place, which computer it was from. Is it my wife's terminal? Is it my terminal? what time of day it happened, how many attempts were made to take this money out of the computer. 
I said, because it's all electronic, you can tell me what I've done. And when I did it, I said, no, we're not going to do that. I says, well, forget it, because I ain't going to pay you. So they said, well, we'll just take out your wages. I says, don't threaten me. I said, I am not going to cave in and pay you. I says, not this time. I said, because you're really running me down now. So anyway, I made several calls to Chesterfield, and I was getting nowhere. And then um, they came back to me and said, oh, we've done a further investigation. We found that you've stolen more money. I said, pardon? You've stolen whatever it says in there, £4,300 or thereabouts. So I said... No, I haven't. Ah, oh, but we've done... I says, well, produce your investigation, day, date, time, place, the usual things I've asked you. And I said, no, you, you will pay us. I says, I'm not going to pay you while I'm in dispute with you. I said, this is an official record on my Horizon system. I've kept my accounts to cover this period. I've got the whole account, because what I did every week is I get an A4 envelope and put everything that I'd done that week in that envelope. All the till rolls, all the balances, uh, the cash, and you could do a stock on hand check, and, I, and I'd press a stock on hand check, and so you could work out, just in case things went wrong, you could say, well, hang on a minute, this is where it happened. So um, I said, I'm on terra firma. Everything's legal. I said, you can't accuse me of theft. Well, well, we'll just have to do something to you. We'll prosecute or we'll take it out your money. I said, no, you won't. So I said, and I want to still speak to Nicky Moore. Eventually, I got a lady. I rang up one day and she says, uh, Nicky Moore doesn't work here anymore, Mr English. I said, you what? She doesn't work. I said, what do you mean she doesn't work here? I said, I clear up this gyro thing in October to December, I said, and there she is in February accusing me. Oh, well, she left the business in October the previous... So I said, she left the business when I had the first accusation from you of £147 or whatever it was, and 12... But why, why, what, do you, what do you want to pinch 12 pence for, for God's sake? You don't nick £142, 12 pence, or £3,700 and 10 pence, do you? You don't do that. You round it up, for God's sake. So anyway, she goes, um, Nicky Moore left the business in October. I said, so what's she doing in the February of the following year accusing me of theft and false accounting or whatever? No comment. So I said, I still want to speak to Nicky. I want to speak to somebody about this. I said, because I'm not having it and I am not paying you. So they... Uh, I mean, when you look back at the initial treatment from when I had the armed robbery, uh, uh, you know, and they say, uh, how much did they get? You're thinking, I'm being treated in the same way. There's no empathy. There's, there's no sympathy. There's no, well, yes, we can see where you're coming from and we can see it's here. They just said, we've conducted investigations. No, you haven't. You're just accusing me but you don't want to prove it, hoping I'll roll over. So, so basically, it went on, and, uh, and you're thinking, well, if this comes out, I'm going to... People are going to go, well, we know Tom. And they're going to look at me and think, well, what a prat, what's he playing at? Why did he do that? And I didn't do it. And I'm convinced a lot of these other sub-postmasters didn't do it. Because once you report something, I mean, I am aware that there's some fantastic sums of money come through this room. And we were always treated in isolation. It's as though you're the only one. There ain't nobody else, pal. And I'm going, no, that's not true. But when you think of how long did it take that Asian gentleman who I saw on the telly, £208,000. I'm going, he's not pitched that. 
something's wrong in the system. If they did a full and complete audit of your office, now in 15 years of being a sub-postmaster, I had three audits in my office. And on one of them they said, this post office is run on very tight lines. Now my wife used to work doing accounts. She was the NAFI manager for the Commando Training Centre at Royal Marines. That's where I, I met her at Limston in Devon. And she did the NAFI accounts. Now there's 3,000 men on that camp. That's a lot of vittles going through the premises to feed 3,000 Marines um, when they went to the NAFI. And I mean beer, sandwiches, you know, you think about it, milk, because all, all, all the recruits, even me when I was a recruit, you just drank milk and Mars bars. Um, and, uh, and that was about the size of it. And I'm thinking, she's not daft. She worked in hotels and did accounts as well. And you're thinking... No, they're right, we did run it on tight lines and we were really scrupulous about what we did. And, uh, and, and it's your honour at the end of the day. Um, you don't want to be labelled and people look at you out the corner and go, oh, yeah, the lad he is, you know. And, and, and they besmirch you and, and, and they don't treat you very nicely, the post office, whereas they should have gone in and conducted a thorough check. As I say, I had three in 15 years and never had a problem with when the auditors... Because they just knock on your door, you know. They didn't say, I'm coming around to see you in the morning. They go, come to do your accounts. Oh, OK. Let them into your house and you stand there while they tot up all the monies and the stamps and everything else. Yeah, that's fine. And off they'd go. I mean, you'd be closed for a good hour, hour and a half. You wouldn't be able to open on time. I'd have to put closed on the front door, so I was losing trade anyhow. So um, it wasn't very nice that way. Um, and it wasn't very nice in other ways, where they decided they wanted us to, to um, sort the mail for them. So they said, what you'll do is you'll put buttons around your walls and you'll hang mail bags on. First class mail, second class mail, parcel mail. Um, you had your special deliveries um, and you'd sort the mail from. And then what you'd do is you'd tie it up with a nylon tie at night and you'd put a label on it saying whether it's first or second class. So I'm thinking, hang on a minute, I'm doing their job for them here and I'm not being paid for it. So... I got on touch with them and I said, uh, oh, um, I'm not doing this. And they said, well, you're in breach of your contract. So I said, what contract? They said, your post office contract. I said, never had a contract. Yes, you did. I said, no, I didn't. You signed. I said, I did sign a piece of paper saying I would get a contract. I says, but that's a bit disjointed, isn't it? You've given me the job and put me in position then you want to impose a contract upon me that I know nothing about. And nobody has discussed with me, and I've not been able to see a solicitor to have it vetted to see if it's a good or bad contract. But that was their favourite get-out. I says, like Horizon, you're in breach of... I says, well, hang on a minute, I, I took office in 99, before the Horizon system I got in 2004. You can't put, impose that upon me. I said... I'm not going to sort your mail. And so I get, a, get a, um, an audit one day, and the lad comes in. I think I called him Kevin. And he goes, I says, what are you doing taking photographs in my house? He goes, oh, well, we've got to be able to prove that. I said, look, if I tell you my daughters are both nursing and out of the back of my post office, you go straight into my kitchen, and I haven't got the facility to hang mail bags on the walls and separate them, then I suggest you take me up. I said, after all, this is a house. It's a 12 by 12 room I traded out of with my post office. And, I mean, I was handling about five, six, seven million pounds a year in cash for them. Um, Mr English, could we um, return to the error notice yeah. in February 2012? 
Um, how is that particular? Well, what happened there off? was we. It sort of eats you up. It's like you know, it's like a roundabout, and, and it's whirring around in your head, and you're going, "What's my next move? Why aren't they giving me the information? What do I do next? Who do I see?" And then, and all the time you're driving or you're shopping, and you're thinking, you, all the evidence is going round in your head, and it consumes you because you're desperate for survival, really. I can imagine some people, it's going to eat them up bad. But I suppose I just get angry. And, and I just think all the time, I'm not paying, I haven't done nothing wrong, I'm going to write to Paula Vanells. So I wrote to Paula Vanells and said, lots of evidence, you've got a problem. Who in the post office is stealing money from me and other sub-postmasters? So I waited, waited a few weeks, didn't get a reply. I thought, that's strange. So I ring them up. I says, uh, I've written to Paula Vanells. Oh, she didn't get your envelope. I mean, this was quite a thick tome, really, of what I put together. I said, well, I sent it recorded delivery. I'll do it again. So I photocopied the whole file and sent it, sent it special delivery. And then they wrote back and said, oh, yes, we've received your envelope and we have found the one before it as well. I thought, well, that's really convenient. And, and then eventually I got a letter from the post office and they said they were apologising. And I thought, no, you're not. If the sub-postmaster would keep his accounts and records straight, I thought, there was nothing wrong with the accounts and records. Just say who's stealing from me and who's stealing from the other sub-postmasters, because the money must be going somewhere. Um, and Do you recall roughly when that was that you wrote to the <sighs> chief executive? It was well into it. it, probably a couple of years down the line even. Um, well, in your in your statement, uh, yep, you actually give a precise date for the for the recorded delivery. Sorry, the spe. Well, let me let me get it right. I think at paragraph sixty, you right say up. you sent the recorded delivery documents on the twenty first of April, twenty twelve. Yes, you've you've rescued me, sir. <laughs> That's all right. Because I was just, I, I, I haven't, I haven't gone through my state. I've just, I, everything's from the top of my head. I knew what I, I, I did. Und I, yeah. I understand that, but I, I just wanted to to establish because yes. it's quite important. Yes. Because this is quite late on in the Horizon saga. Oh yes. That you were providing this uh, oh, oh, information. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I did, sir. Yes, and um, uh, as I say, I did that, and and then I got this letter of sort of apology. I wasn't very happy with it. Who was the author of that letter? Honest Do you know, I, honest, I, I can't remember. It's in the system some way. I, I have not seen all the evidence I provided way back to Alan Bates from because I was one of the original 150 complainants. Um, and then obviously Freeth's escalated that to about 550. Um, so I, I can't, I can't because that evidence is now in the system somewhere, either with Second Sight or Alan Bates or Freeth's. I would think they've copied it and sent it to, to Howen Corps. I hope they have. But I haven't seen any of the original evidence at all for, for years. How did your appointment as a sub-postmaster come to an end? Um, it came to an end... They wanted to close me three times, and then they kept me open, and then the second time. And at the third time, I thought, we want to close you, and it's definite. I thought, well, I'm 62 years old. I'll call it a day. I can, I can sort of retire. My daughters are working. Um, and uh, my wife was drawing her old age pension then, because she's 18 months older than me.
Um, and I, I just said, right, that's it. And then we closed on the 14th of January, 2014. And that was the end of it then. Can you estimate how much you believe you paid in to make good shortfall shown by Horizon? You know, actually, um, only over a thousand pounds or so. See, what happened is the post office engaged Second Sight, Ron Warmington's firm and, and others, and they established that it wasn't the sub-postmasters that were at fault, it was the post office. And then the post office cut them out of the equation, uh, terminated their contract, and wanted all the information back. And I understand that he wouldn't give it to them. I mean, I suspect what would have happened to all that evidence, it would have been shredded probably. But having said that, um, he said, no, I'm not giving it to you, and it was referred on. And then the post office came up with a set of forensic accountants that we could go to, and I chose, I think it was Paver, um, uh, Bill Cleghorn up in Edinburgh, and uh, I went up to see him personally, and we had a chat, and... We were then going to go to arbitration with the post office, and they sent us a letter. Why do some postmasters think that arbitration is, is, is a case to talk for more money? I thought, well, that's what unions do, isn't it? And, and they said, well, it isn't. You, you know, there will be no more money on the table. And so I said to, to Bill, I said, uh, he says, they want a meeting with us in Manchester, I think it was. So I said, uh, OK. We'll go to Manchester. He says, I'll meet you there. So I says, well, I'll tell you now, I'm going to bring a tape recorder. He goes, you what? He says, I'm going to bring a tape recorder. I'm going to put it on the table and said, if this is good enough for me as a police officer, it's good enough for all you post office investigators so we can have everything out and then we can publish it if we have to. He says, don't do that. I said, why? He says, because somebody's tried it before and it didn't go down very well. I says, oh, so they want to arrest people, take them to police stations, interview them under caution on a tape recorder and get them to cough to something they probably haven't done because there's a plea bargain going on. Well, if you plead to this charge, you, you won't get done with this. This is the more serious charge. You plead to this one, you, you get less time or, you know, you get less of a penalty. I says, well, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me and I will bring a tape recorder. So he said, no, no. He says, I said, well, call it off. I don't want to go. So I didn't go. But they offered me, he says, oh, they're offering you 1,500 quid. I says, OK. I said, 1,500 quid. I says, you're joking. He goes, no. He said, uh, you know, oh, there's, the, the, the distance between us, what they said in the letter was, is £1,000, and then we'll give him £500 compensation. I says, you're joking. Not after what they've done to some of these other people. I says, no, I'm not having that. So um, he says, but there'll be a non-disclosure on it. I says, what, for 1,500 quid, non-disclosure? I says, no. I says, I'm not taking the money and I'm not signing a non-disclosure. And that's me and the post office finished. Um, I'd like to ask you finally a bit about how the problems you had with Horizon affected you and your wife. What was the impact upon your health? Um, the impact... You were constantly tired. You constantly think you're being worn down. You're constantly thinking about your next move. You're constantly thinking about how am I going to get information to prove what I want to prove? Why aren't they helping me? And like I said earlier, it's like this merry-go-round. You can get on, but you can't get off. And, and you're thinking, well, how can I stop it to get off so I can go back to leading a normal life? Because after I closed, this was still going on. And, I mean, I thought I'd spend more time with my mum in Middlesbrough. But we closed in the January, and she died in the May. Um, I mean, she was 88. But, sadly, I thought I'd spend more time with her because I did leave home in 69 when I was 16, 17 years old. Uh, but I always went back to Middlesbrough to see my mum. 
and um, and you're thinking, well, mum's gone. And then ten months later, my wife's mum was gone. My mum was in the northeast. Brenda's mum was in Leicester. And you've got this going on, and and you're commuting around trying to clear up the estates and the houses. Uh, I mean, they're quite simple because we we're council house kids, my wife and I, and um, not that that's bad. That's good. But having said that. Um, and then my wife's brother died in Brighton. He just died. And, uh, and you've got um, my wife's aunt died, my wife's cousin died, and you've got all this going on, and you're trying to clear all these things up because they had, you know, um, nobody to do it for them. And uh, it, it's, it's all added pressure. And, and it does your head in, really. You're thinking, I've got to do this, but I've got to do this as well. And I've got to prepare all these statements and, and I've got to get all this stuff out and, and, and write something that's coherent and, and you've got a timeline to it. Um, very tiring, very confusing, quite distressing. It plays on your kids as well because you think, if this comes out, my kids are going to get hell. Because that's where kids operate. How did the time you spent resolving these issues affect your relationship with your wife and children? Um, we didn't let it get to us, let's put it like that. We just kept plodding on and, and, and just keep fighting. Um, and that's what happened. We just kept fighting. And I wasn't going to let go of the bone, so to speak. You've referred um, to uh, Mr. Alan Bates and, and the group litigation. Yeah. Were you a participant in that? I, I said I was participant from the, from the outset. Um, and how much did you receive by way of compensation? About £4,000. I can't remember the exact amount of money, but um, it was about four four and a half thousand pounds I, I received from... Because, I mean, most of that money... And we couldn't have got where we were without the backers, if you like, which they took about 46 million, didn't they? I think the people who backed it, um, and I'm not decrying that, because without their help, we wouldn't have got this far. And, and then the money was split up. I don't know what they, they, they split it up on, but they obviously had a, an algorithm, if you like, and, and, and that was it. Um, and that's... As I say, that's what I received. How do you feel about the way the post office treated you and other sub postmasters who experienced problems with Horizon? I don't think they treated any of us very well. They went at us like... They were judge, jury and executioner. They had the power. They were this big organisation up there. They had all the answers. And, and I just felt that they felt they could do with you as they wished, what they will. Um, and that's, that's basically how I felt about them. No empathy. And, and the robbery at my office bears it out. Not a bunch of flowers for my wife or anything. How much money did they get? Well, they got nothing. Oh, that's all right. And, and then, as I say, um, that sort of continued throughout. Oh, we've lost a docket. Well, you've had the money, but the docket's missing. Well, I, I'm sorry, I put the docket there. Oh, I didn't take a bill. But yeah, but I, I've, I've sorted that out. And it's, it's sort of, they want to bite you all the time. And even when they know they're wrong, they won't admit they're wrong. And when you look at it, I mean, I'm an ex-Royal Marine, I'm an ex-police officer... You are what you are. You are um, the subject of your environment and your upbringing. And I was a, a council house kid born in West Hartlepool um, and, and, uh, and raised in Middlesbrough, schooled in Middlesbrough. Played rugby for 15 years. Very competitive at sport. Um, and I've always been a forthright person. Um, I mean, I was told I don't suffer fools lightly, and I suppose I don't. And I wouldn't suffer the post office in the end when they were trying to do me for that money. And I just feel as though if they carry out correct and proper audits with stock in, stock out, 
they could find a lot of this money and think, well, he's not taking it, where's it gone? Um, and when you think of, as I say, my background, um, I've always been a bit tenacious and I can be very fiery, um, which is why I exploded at the robbery of my office. It's just action and reaction. And I feel threatened by the post office, and if, the th if I feel threatened, then some of the people who sat here before me certainly felt threatened, because they suffered a lot more than I did. They went to prison, they had babies in prison, you know, they, they tried to save their reputations, and, and, uh, and they were trashed, basically, by the post office. They didn't care about trashing your reputation, they just cared about themselves. When I reflect back, um, I had to pay the first 25% 25, 25 of my first year's salary went to the post office, free gratis. So out of about 22 grand a year, I gave them 25% of my salary for taking a post office on. That, that money was non-returnable. And you're thinking, when you've made an investment like that, when you've got... 25,000 sub-postmasters, now about 11,000. We were paying, and our investments, our, I mean, our investments in the post office as sub post must have been 100 million pounds or more, quite easily. And, and you're thinking, well, I'm paying part of their wages. I'm paying part of their pensions, because they've got a job, because I've invested in the post office. The biggest investors in the post office were the sub-postmasters. And on one occasion, they refused me access to my line manager. I thought I was doing about five or 6,000 car taxes a year. And then the post office up the road, because I paid for that as part of my business. I bought that as part of my business. They give it to another chap up the road. And I took umbrage. I says, why didn't you discuss it with me? Well, because we don't have to. Well, hang on a minute, that's not nice. And uh, push came to shove. This, this big area manager come to see me. And he says, I think you should consider your position. I says, pardon, I pay part of your wages. I says, if I wasn't here, would you be there? If the network was smaller, would you be there? And as I say... If they'll do that to you and they'll threaten you, I can understand why some others might cave in, but I, I certainly wouldn't. Um, and I, as I say, I think I'm a man of substance and because of my background, I will be argumentative and questioning. Um, I've been, as I say, I've been a sub-postmaster for 15 years. I did have my armed robbery and the post office made their stance and from the word go, I felt that was their stance. How much money did they get? Um, now, when these robbers came into my office, they wanted money off me. Now, the post office have just done it another way. They didn't use a gun. They just threatened you through the back door and over the telephone and, and then say, well, you've got to plead guilty to this, or we, but we're going to have the money off you. But they haven't... They haven't carried out due, 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 due diligence. Law can only work if we all acquiesce to it and go, yeah, that's fine. Once that stops, then you get lawlessness. And I think the post office were quite lawless because they did not act diligently. And uh, there's little wonder that we are where we are and a lot of people have fallen by the wayside. What was it, 33 deaths? Not good. Some of it could have been stopped. Um, I just feel as though the trust you think you've got in a big organisation fails when they fail. And I think the post office failed sadly. English, I've got no further questions for you. Is there anything you'd like to add? To what no, that's, that's, I think I've said everything now. Thank you. 
Um, sir, would you like to... Do you have any questions for... No, no, I don't have any additional questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr English, for coming to give evidence before me and to use a word I think you used about yourself, being so forthright about it all. Um, I, I appreciate uh, the way in which you've sought to give me as much detail as possible. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you, Chair. It's now a quarter past 11. Our next witness, uh, Mr Thomas Brown, um, will be appearing remotely. Um, to allow uh, for the necessary arrangements to be made, sh shall we resume in 10 minutes' time at 25 past? Certainly, that's fine, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, Chair. Hello, Mr Brown. Can you see and oh. hear us? Yes, I can see and hear you, yeah. Thank you. Um, the and Ms Hodge, Mr Brown and I have already had an introduction introductory chat, so it's over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr Brown, um, the Usher Jane will take you through your affirmation. Good morning, Mr Brown. Good um, morning. If you'd just like to repeat after me, please. I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely. And truly. And truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr Brown, as you know, my name is Catriona Hodge and I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Yeah. Please, can you state your full name? Thomas George Brown. Thank you. Mr Brown, you made a witness statement on the 11th of January of this year, is that right? Yeah. Yes. Um, do you have a copy of that statement? I do, you? yes. Please, could you turn to the final page? It's page 12. Yeah. Do you see uh, your signature at the top of that page? Yes, yes. Have you had an opportunity to read your statement since you first? I have, read it? yes, I've been reading it. Yes. Um, is it is the content true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes, it is. Yes. I'd like to begin um, by asking you um, a few short questions about your background. C forgive me. Can you hear me? I can. Clearly? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. um, where in the country are you from? I was born in a. Uh, a town called Hortney Spring, it's in County Durham, or a little village outside of Hortney Spring called Philadelphia. Not in America, I might add. <laughs> How old are you now, Mr Brown? Pardon? How old are you now? 76. Um, you were married for many years, is that right? I was married until her wife took ill in uh, 1999, and she died in 2003 with breast cancer. You currently live with your son and grandchildren, is that right? Yes, we do, yes. Um, please, can you tell us about your career before you joined the post office? When I left school, I started this, I went to college for a year uh, and I got a job as, um, I got an apprenticeship with the National Coal Board as a, an apprentice electrician. And, I mean, the first year... <laughs> I was at college for a full year, and you had to be qualified. Uh, you know, I had to pass certain exams, and I served a five-year apprenticeship at what it wasn't the mines, it was an area workshop, which did all the repairs for the mines. Uh, and I served my time as an electrician. What did your wife do before you purchased a post? She, was, she worked at a company called the Caterpillar Tractor Country uh, Company, and she worked in accounts. Uh, yeah, she worked in accounts. Thank you. Um, she did the wages, I think, for the uh, for the employees of the Caterpillar Company. Why did you decide to become a sub postmaster? Well, it started in about 1979, 1980. The wife was made redundant 
because the company was closing. So we decided to buy a post office, a little tiny little village post office um, in Chester Moor, it was with Fry Chester Street in County Durham. So we bought that and we sold it. The, the money she got off the redundancy and the house we sold, uh, we paid for the little post office, which had a three bedroom house with it as well. And we, uh, in, the wife worked in that. But I also, but when she got, I've jumped the gun a little bit. When she went for the interview, I had to go for the interview as well. So we both were interviewed for the post office. Uh, but I was, at that particular time, I was still working. But we worked in there uh, for, she had that about two years. Uh, and we decided we got off. Actually, we got offered a big post office, a bigger post office in a, a, a little town called Fence Houses, which is in County Durham, which had a, it was a bigger post office and it had a big general dealers. Uh, so we bought that. And then I decided to take my redundancy uh, while I was, was there so I could work full time in the post office with her because it was a, a lot bigger post office. So that's what I did. I took my redundancy and we worked in the post office together. But then we were offered again to put in for a post office in Gateshead, in Berkeley in Gateshead, uh, which was a smaller in premises, but it was a, a much, much bigger salary. So we bought that one and we were there until 1999 when the wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. So we sold it and we bought a post office. Uh, sorry, we sold the post office and we bought a house. Then I got it, I applied for a job for Finley's North East, which was a big huge agent, and it had a few post offices. And I was manager of a couple of post offices for them. And I, I was working there till what, 2008. And one of the post offices, which I was work, looking after, came up for sale and they offered it as it for 150,000. So I decided to buy that, or I had to get a mortgage for it. Uh, and I got a mortgage for it and that's when the problem started. But the problems were still there, really, when I was looking after it, we were having shortfalls in the horizon system. Um, Mr. Brown, you, forgive me, you may have said, but to clarify, which, which branch was it that you purchased in 2008? North Kent in, New, in Newcastle. Thank you. Um, so before purchasing that branch, you had, for quite a number of years, worked for the post office. Oh, yes, yes. And I used to look after post offices for the poor, because we had plenty of stuff in, in the Berkeley one. I used to go to different post offices looking after them if people had gone on holiday uh, or even when some of, some of the postmasters had been finished. So uh, I used to play it about, I, look, I looked after a, quite a number of post offices in Durham at the time. Um, you've explained that the branch came up uh, for sale. Um, was that in, in and around February 2008? Yes, it was February 2008, I, I purchased it, yeah, yeah, I bought it. And it... Um, I think you've... Had uh, four counties, it had, it was a, a really big post, it was one of the biggest in Newcastle, it had four outlets, and it was a massive shop side as well, it was a news agents and general dealers. So there was a, a retail side to the business yeah. as well as the post office yes, business. Yes, a big retail. Um, you've explained that the, the purchase price was £150,000, yeah. which you financed by placing a mortgage on your home, is that correct? Yeah, on my home and my flat. I had a flat as well. 
Um, you've described it as a large branch. Did you employ staff to assist you in running the branch? Three, I had three girls working for us in the post office and two girls working in the shop side because it was really busy. What was your... I mean, we didn't work every day of the week, but on the busy days, there was... Uh, on the real busy days, that we had four counters going. What salary did you receive from the post office for running the North Kenton 48, branch? 48,000. 48,000. And for how long did you run that branch? Until it would be December 2008 when I had the audit. And it came up £85,000 short. But I was keep phoning the help desk during that, saying I was, I was short. And it got to the stage where they were just saying, put it in your suspense account. It'll come back, but it never did come back. And when I got the audit, <clears throat> I was £85,000 short. And I got, I got suspended on that, on that day. Um, this was on the 25th of November 2008, that, is that right? Yes. Yes. Um, an audit of your branch was carried out. Yeah. Um, can you describe what happened that day, please? Well, they, they did the audit, and, and when the first came and I said, mind, you do realise I'm going to be short because there's, there's money in the suspense, and they, they just ignored it, and they did the audit and they said, you're at 85,000, and they just shut the post of his that particular time, even when there was customers standing waiting to be served. So what I uh, so what they did was uh, they closed it for about four days until they got um, their own staff in and put it in. But I, then I, I decided I'll try and keep the shop side going, and I worked in the shop side. And they kept one of the girls on it I employed because they didn't have enough. The, I think there was two, two chaps what the post always put in, and the, the, they kept the, one of the girls that I, I employed for the busy days. And the, the funny thing about it was the first week, she came up to me and she says we're nearly £2,000 short. <laughs> so what was going on, I'd assume, every week. Even when uh, the horse took over. Um, coming back to the day of the audit on the 25th of November. Yeah. Um, from what you've said, um, it didn't come as a surprise to you that a discrepancy was found. No, no. When had you first started experiencing discrepancies in your accounts? Well, within... The there was always shortages, even, you know, small shortages, but on the busy days. I mean, even when I, when the changeover came, when I bought the post, so is, we were £3,000 short that week, that, um, that day I took over as some postmaster, and the company, had to, Finley's company had to pay the 3000 in, but it had been happening every week, and Finley's was putting the money in. You've described, um, I think, contacting the helpline, is that right? About yeah. the discrepancies you were experiencing. Yeah, and they just said it would come back, put it in the suspense account. What did you understand? Them I got no help from that. I got absolutely no help from the help desk. So uh, at the end of the day, I never bothered after that. Uh, just hoping it would come back, but it never did. And it went on for, what, seven, eight months like that until it mounted up the £85,000 until I got the audit. But it was still going on after these people took over, I think. Well, it did. Uh, it did for a uh, couple of weeks after I so, saw... But I... even when the court case came, I said, the, the, I think the reason why they didn't press any charges was because the same thing was happening to them. Had you experienced any problems using Horizon before you took over um, the 
uh, branch. Well, uh, yeah, yeah the, there was a fault on the, uh, what they call the base unit on the computer system. It said there was a fault on it. And uh, the engineers came out and they changed the base units. So, I mean, I, do, I, I, I don't know what the problem was, but they said there was a problem with them and they changed the base units. When you first started experiencing problems with Horizon, having taken over the North Kenton branch, what did you suspect was the cause of the discrepancies? Well, I thought it was the cause. Uh, uh, originally, I thought it could have been the lottery because the lottery was in the shop side but it was linked to the to the to the post office. You had to transfer money in, and uh, the scratch cards. You had to charge the the lottery for the the post office for the scratch cards. And the money went backwards and forwards, and I thought this could be the problem. That was the Horizon system. But obviously, I found out later. Uh, it was the um, sorry, the lottery system. Where uh, obviously I found out it wasn't. It was the computer itself. I couldn't take uh, when when I got the my first solicitor. He said he got a, a computer expert. I mean, obviously, he couldn't look at the computer, but he said. The way you explain it, there was he thinks the memory of the computer kind of com, uh, kind of uh, compete with the footfall that's coming into your office, uh, and obviously what's happening is when you're doing some transactions and you're paying them out, it isn't going through the computer. Therefore, it might be giving the customer a receipt, but at the end of the day, you should you that money short if you paid somebody. A hundred pound, but it wasn't going through the computer. You're a hundred pound short. What was when the footfall? Did, sorry, what was the footfall like at the North Kenyan? The two main days, it was horrendous. The kiosk was up was up the street because it was a little shopping centre, uh, and I was next door to a, a huge comprehensive school, so it was really really busy. You know, you're talking about. Maybe it's nearly a thousand pound, a thousand people in one day. Well, in a couple of days, in the two main days, it was really, really busy. You've explained that when you contacted the helpline, you were advised to roll the sums over. Is that correct? Yeah, into the suspense account. What effect did that have on your monthly balancing? What? <laughs> It, was, it just went here, why? You know, it was, it was way out of control. I had, to, I had to do false accounting, saying the money was there. But I had no other choice. What could I do? I mean, I got no help whatsoever from the post office. That didn't help us at, at, at all. The only... It was just horrendous, really. I was short every week. I mean, uh, one of the area managers came out, but he was no help at all. I was explaining the situation to him, but all he got off the post was it'll come back. But it never, nothing ever came back. You've explained that the audit on the 25th of November 2008 identified an apparent discrepancy of more than £85,000. Yeah, yeah. What were you told had been the cause of that discrepancy? I've taken the money. And they shut the door and... Uh, they just shut the post office. And then when the post office charges with, uh, with theft and I had to go to the police station. Um, they put us in a prison cell for, a, for an hour because the post office inquiry people weren't there and they, they shoved us in a cell for an hour. And what happened? 
Well, because the poor Soviet, the police weren't, were not questioning us. It was two people from the poor Soviet uh, that they were questioning us and had to wait for them coming in. When they did come in, you know, they just simply accused us of stealing the money. And I said, I have never touched a penny. So what they said was, after the questions, they said, we want to come through at your house and search it. And I, at the time, I didn't think they were allowed to do that. But anyway, they came to the house. They followed us through to my house, and the search went right through the house. But obviously, they didn't find anything. I said, "Then well, are you going to look for your eighty-five thousand pound lying in the house?" It was unbelievable, really. How did you feel about your house being searched? Absolutely horrendous. I, I, it was the, it was your privacy invaded, you know. I mean, absolutely. And they just walked about there looking in cupboards and opening drawers and you had no pride. They, they just took over, basically. Anyway, but they didn't find nothing so, which I knew they wouldn't like, would. You've explained... Then, sorry, Mr Brown. Then when the first case, when I was, the case came up to the, uh, the magistrate's court, they give us the date for the, uh, the, the, the charges was theft, and it had to go to Crown Court, and they give us the dates for the Crown Court. But that's when I went about, it was, the date was, what was, for the Crown Court was the 17th of June 2013. That was the official date of the of the case. But my solicitor got a phone call saying that they were fetching it forward a fortnight. We had to go into court, the Crown Court, a fortnight earlier. And my solicitor says, there's a rabbit up here. I think they're going to drop the case. And sure enough, when we got there, the, body, the post office Boris, Boris just said that we are dropping the case. We've got no evidence to bring. And that was it. Mr Brown, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I, I want to get the chronology right, if I may. Um, Ms Hodges uh, established with you that the audit which led to you being charged, took place in November 2008, yeah? Yes. Uh, but you just told me that um, the Crown Court date was June 2013, yeah. which is getting close to five years afterwards. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the... that surprised me, so I'd like you to explain what was happening. Well, well what happened years. was, be, because I got another little job, I'll... I lost my house and I got a, a, a little bungalow through the Housing Association and I got a little job driving the van. But the post office didn't fetch the charges until 2012. So, so let me get this straight. The, the audit is 2008. And they didn't fetch the charges until 2012. I got a letter through the post saying that we are charging you with theft. So, right, OK. Um, and in the meanwhile, did they try to get the 85,000 no. alleged for, shortfall from you? No. Right, OK. Sorry, Miss Hodge, I just wanted to get that clear while it was in my mind. The, the, what, uh, after the court case, the court case, after the, sorry, after the close, the post always, I tried to run the shop. But it wasn't viable. I couldn't afford to keep the premises going. So I closed the shop as well, sold the stock, and I got a little driving job just to try and tide us over. But then I got a letter, a letter came in the post from the post office, round about nearly 2012, I think it was, that they were charging us with theft. Then that's why the court case, I went to, the magistrate's courts first, then 
with the charge, the the charges, and the magistrates courts sent us to Crown Court, and that was it. But it was it. There was a gap of a, a few years. It wasn't um, immediately after I'd uh, been finished. I couldn't understand that, right? Because I thought it was over and done with. Mr. Brown, you've described attending an interview and your home being searched. Yeah. In terms of the chronology, can you recall when those events took place? When the what? Can you repeat? Yes, the, your interview at the police station and, oh, the, yeah. and the search of your home. Yeah. Do you recall when they took place? Was it closer oh. in time to the audit or to the point at which you were charged? Oh, it was... Uh... It was about, oh, it was long after the audit. Yeah, it was long after the audit. I can't remember the dates, it's that long ago. Really, I can't. But it was long after the audit. You've explained that as a result of the audit, you were suspended, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, who was responsible for running your branch during the period of your suspension? Um, the post I was put, uh, I don't know who they were, but the, the put, it was two people that put in to look at, to run the post I was, well, I mean, obviously I didn't know who they were. Uh, and they kept one of the girls I had working for us, they kept her on as well. But I mean, I only worked another f couple of months, then I, I couldn't keep the office going. The shop side going, sorry. So I closed the uh, shop side and sold the stock. And I let up, I give the keys to the post office for the shop premises and everything. <clears throat> then I don't know what happened. I think they just closed the post office altogether. I think it went into one of the shops above the, in the shopping centre. I think they gave it to one of them. I really don't know. I never went, I never ever went back. You've described, I think, that during the period of your suspension, those who were running the branch continued to experience yeah. apparent discrepancies. That's what the girl was. The, the, the girl that used to work for us came up and said, "We're short. We're short. We're a couple." Of, this was the first week. She said we were nearly two thousand pounds short. Following your suspension, how did your appointment as a sub-postmaster come to an end? The, the, I couldn't work, they just suspended us and they said I had to resign. So I, I, I had to resign. Why they said that, I mean, and they just, they wouldn't allow us to go anywhere near the post office. What effect did the closure of the post office, you've, you've described a little of the circumstances in which your retail business closed, but can you explain what effect um, the closure of the post office had upon your retail well, business? It meant that I lost, I lost all my income. And I tried to get a little job, but it was, it was a little driving job, but it was, actually it was working for Amazon delivering parcels, but it, it was too much, I was too old for that. And I went, and I couldn't afford to pay the the money for the the mortgage for the houses and the flat, and my son got a, a loan out trying to help us because he his name was on the mortgage as well. Anyway, I mean we, we couldn't afford to live in that in the properties we had, and we we both went bankrupt. What effect did your bankruptcy have on the properties that you owned? Horrendous. We just lost them all together. And I had, we were made homeless. And the people that had the properties, uh, it took the properties, give us a week in the house to find another place to live. But luckily, uh, the housing association gave us a, a little two-bedroom bungalow. Well, it was horrendous. I mean, 
It just crippled me. It didn't. All we worked for, all our lives lost. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Please don't apologise, Mr. Brown. Would you like to take a, a, a short break? Oh, I'm, I'm fine, fine. Can you describe the current state of your finances, please? Well, I've got a, I've got a, a mine workers pension and a state pension. My son works full time, so we're managing. You know, we're not rich on. And when it, when I got the money from the. Uh, what Freeze got for the we only there was only eleven million to be shared between five and fifty. But the problem was I got I think I was thirty odd thousand. But fifty one percent of that money I received had to go to the uh, bankruptcy people. So the money I had left and the bills I had to pay outstanding bills I had to pay. I had hardly anything left, you know, really. So just to break that down, you um, you participated as a claimant in the group litigation, is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and you received a, a share of the settlement? Yeah, but the, two, the bankruptcy people took 51% of it off us. Well, I mean, that bankruptcy's finished now, though. Uh, because I didn't realise that after, that after the seven years, it still goes on five years after the, after the bankruptcy, apparently. I didn't know that. Anyway, they took 51% of us. So that left you with about £15,000? Yeah, yeah. Which ought to pay some a lot of it out for the money I owe to certain people. You've explained that you had invested £150,000 in purchasing yeah. the branch in the first instance. Yeah. And you lost your home and your flat. Lost me home, my flat. To what extent does that £15,000 compensate you for the financial losses which you suffered? <laughs> By the time I paid bills that I, people that I owed money, you know, companies that I owed money, you know, to pay bills off, we were left about about five thousand pounds. So all that for five thousand pound. By the time I paid all my debts. The good thing about it is it paid me debts off what I had left. So, at least I'm in no debt now. That's the only good thing about it. But I mean, I must have lost, if you would take the value of my properties, my bungalow was worth about 230,000, and my flat about 105. But when the bankruptcy people took it over, they, they didn't sell it on the open market. The, uh, they just put it on for auction, and they only got 150,000 for the house and 50,000 for the flat. Well, I couldn't understand why they wouldn't put it on the open market. But still. I'd like to return briefly to your prosecution, if I may, just to clarify a few points. Um, you've explained to the chair you were charged in... 2012 yeah. with a with an offence of theft is that correct yeah were you also charged with false accounting false accounting as well yes yeah i thought i mentioned that it was theft and false accounting but the false accounting was why i is because i was putting it into the suspense account and you put it in the spent suspense account because that's what you'd been advised to do uh, originally yeah but I just carried on doing that and, you know, but at the end of the month, you couldn't, you couldn't keep it in the event. You had to say it, right, that money's there, if you know what I mean. But the post office wouldn't. I mean, strictly speaking, it was false accounting right until the end, but I mean, 
what what are the what could I do? The post office were doing nothing. Them said the, the computer was fine. You you pleaded not guilty to those charges. Yeah. That's right, isn't it? Um, as a result of which your case was transferred to the Crown Court. Crown Office, yeah, yeah. Um, and the recall this a fortnight earlier before the proper trial had to begin. You and would, that's fine. Sorry, you, you were told that the post office weren't proceeding with the prosecution. They said they're fetching no evidence. That's where these very words were uh, the post office is not fetching any evidence against it. Do you recall what, if anything, the judge said to you? Yeah. He says, I'm sure you'll take this further, Mr Brown. He said, well, you're not... I'm finding you're not guilty, Mr Brown, but I'm sure you'll take this any further. I think you'll take this further. Have you taken any steps to um, recover compensation in relation to your prosecution? Well, I... I mean, I've got to be Alan Gray to start at the uh, so postmasters. Uh, I think he's done a tremendous job. And, I mean, I'm still in that, but, I mean, obviously I'm with Heaven Court. But, I mean, Alan Bates is the person to thank for, really, for the, uh, as far as we've got now. Because if it wasn't for him, we would be nowhere near. How did you feel when you were told originally that the post office would be bringing criminal charges against you? Well, I says no matter what, even if I, I go to prison, I'm not pleading guilty. I'm not pleading guilty to something I didn't do. And that was it. I mean, that was a horrendous time. I mean, point? what gets me is it's taken the government and the war stories to wait nearly 20 years after an inquiry and inquiry after this, and they know exactly what, what the problem is. Why don't they just pay the people? I mean, some people haven't even lived to see the end of it. They've died. I mean, it's true what the... The most of the sub postmasters are not very young people. They're either middle-aged or getting older. And what are they going to wait another 20 years when they say half of them are all dead? The government's got to pay it out now, really. Or they've got to sort it out. Was your prosecution reported in the local press, Mr Brown? Oh, it was horrendous. Yeah. Yeah, it was the funny thing about it is it was all over the Northern Echo and the and the Newcastle Chronicle. But when I was found not guilty in that, there was a little paragraph in the in the Evening Chronicle. So it, it never I mean people still think you took it. So I mean, you know there'll never be peace about it, really. People still think you took the money. I mean, I'll never ever get over it. What effect did these events have on your health, Mr Brown? Well, I had basically really a nervous breakdown. I couldn't... I mean, that's why I packed this party. I couldn't cope with the it was because we had, we couldn't live, we couldn't, we couldn't, but we had no money, we were destitute. We weren't getting it. All I had was a, a, a small a mine workers' pension to live off. And my son worked, but he had kids, you know. It was just a horrendous. And the told you the post office having a system that was faulty and they knew that.
You've described. The I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. The knew the system was folly. They really did. And uh, uh, something should be done about the, the post of these people at the top. And then they, they must have known about it, you know. Anyway, I can't make no better of it now. We should be compensated, really compensated. You've described receiving support from your son. Yeah. Took out. I couldn't go without my son. My son's been the saviour. And the grandkids. Oh. What effect did this have on your son? Well, he stood up to it better than I did, but I mean, he's, I mean, he had, he's got two, three grandkids to look after. So he had to look after them. I mean, and he works mainly nights. So, I mean, he works hard and, I mean, it's hit him hard. He, he, he lost all his money, all his savings, everything just to help me. How did it affect his relationship with his wife? Well, it separated. I mean, but fortunately, uh, he's got the grandkids, uh, the, the two lads, and the girls are away at university now, but I mean, he's got the two boys living with us. Never get over it, never ever get over it. You, you've said, Mr. Brown, that you think what needs to be done now is that proper compensation is paid. Is that right? That's, That's your... right. I think, I mean, uh, the compensation that we offered in, in the first place. 57 million for five. I mean, that was just ridiculous. What we need is everybody's should be sat down and put down what exactly what they've lost, and they should get compensated for that. Whatever they've lost, plus the salaries. I mean, they've lost the livelihoods for no fault of their own through a system that wasn't good enough to cope with the the system they had, the, the post office bought the cheapest equipment, so I've been told you could buy, and it wasn't good enough to, to do the job it was supposed to be doing. Anyway, I'm not a computer expert, so that's what I've been told, the computer wasn't up the standard for the system it needed to do. And I heard that the very first week it happened, that a, a chap who was a computer expert never looked at it, but he just quoted what they found out. What, what he said in the beginning is turned out to be completely true, that the, the, the computer couldn't cope with the footfall of your office. And that's as simple as that. It wasn't registering all of the payouts. So consequently, when he came to do a balance, you were short. Simple as that. Sorry, can I just ask you to clarify, who, who, who came up with that explanation? That it, it was, was, a, do with it was a, um, a computer expert that uh, me first, Sir Michael Henderson, solicitors had. Uh, he was my first solicitor, and he just, I, he just asked the computer expert what he thought, and, and he said that um, the way he explained it to us, the footfall he's getting, and the computer couldn't com compete, com 
Pete with the football, and by the time he was paying it out and the people were coming in, it wasn't going through the memory of the post of the computer or something like that, and consequently, he would be short. It would the person would get the money, but it wouldn't go through the system saying he's paid it out. Therefore, he would be short of that money. He would be short. Did this expert produce a report? Oh, no, no, it was just an opinion of it. No, 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 nothing like that. It was just his opinion when we explained it to him. It was just his opinion. Thank you, Mr Brown. I have no further questions for you. Is there anything that you would like to say to the chair that we've not already covered? No, I think that's... I think I've, I've said enough, really. I mean... I'm a little bit too upset now. Thank you. All so, right. Well, it's been very good to hear from you. Uh, and um, you can rest assured that I'll be taking close attention, paying close attention to what you've told me, as I will, of course, with all the other sub postmasters who've been good enough to make statements or give evidence before me. So thank you again, uh, Mr. Brown for Thank taking the time and trouble to, to explain all this to me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's almost a quarter past 12. Um, that concludes our witnesses for this morning's session. Um, I wonder if um, we were to take an early lunch and see if we could resume a little earlier this afternoon. All right. Well, um, let's say we won't start before 1.30, but if we can start at 1.30, you can send me an email to alert me to that, and I'll make sure I'm on the screen, all right? Thank you, sir.